The health insurance experiment was the largest social experiment in the history of science. Probably the most expensive experiment that ever has been done. 82 million over uh, 10 or 12 years. In today's dollars, somewhere between 250 and 300 million dollars. Which is one of the reasons why it's never going to be done again. In the 1960s, government was a major force in all kinds of social problems. The government was really into these big social experiments. Several of which Rand was involved in. The negative income tax experiment, several housing experiments. The electricity supply experiment. The whole war on poverty, after all, was a big experiment. There's unconditional war on poverty in America. We passed Medicare and Medicaid in 1965, 66, and the general feeling was that we were gonna have national health insurance. One of the major contenders for ongoing health insurance in the country was, let's just extend Medicare to everyone. Everybody along the way had a plan. Senator Kennedy had a plan. Even Nixon was talking about designing a universal national health insurance plan. I got involved in Nixon's family assistance plan. Family assistance system. And in particular, proposals for the reform of Medicaid. The Nixon administration was having an internal debate about whether there should be any co-payments in Medicaid. It was difficult, if not impossible, to figure out what the response to price was by consumers. If I don't have to pay as much for the doctor, will I go more often? And if I go more often or less often, will it make any difference on my health outcomes? Basic economics tells you if the price is lower, you're going to consume more. If the price is higher, you're going to consume less, all else being equal. The problem was how much more, how much less. There was really very little in the way of data. People's views were mostly based on ideology. This was a question that had bedeviled economists for years. What if we fielded an experiment to test the effects of coinsurance? I had submitted a grant. This unsolicited proposal landed on my desk. That somehow found its way to Larry Orr, who was at that time an economist at the Office of Economic Opportunity. I read the proposal and I said, these guys are really smart. He liked what I was proposing in the grant. This is the group to do this experiment. Then he came out to see me. He showed up in my office in the old Rand building and said, why don't you think about an experiment? And I said, oh, uh, okay. And lo and behold, a grant was forthcoming to design an experiment. The early questions were, how much accuracy would we get? How many sites should we have? How many families or people do we have to have? Basically, it's a question of statistical power. How many people do you need to be able to make these kind of statistical statements with at least 90% certainty that you've nailed the truth down? The great thing about the health insurance experiment was that it was a randomized trial. Families would be randomized to you pay everything, you pay nothing, and everything in between. If something differs between uh, people who get one kind of insurance and people who get another kind of insurance, it's due to the insurance. Carl Morris developed something called the finite selection model that made things even more comparable than random would. It's based on a really fun idea that comes, <laughs> comes out of choosing up teams in sports because they're choosing not just randomly but intelligently. I got to meet the young analyst who was running the project, Joe Newhouse. I was a little skeptical and began to ask him a bunch of questions. I had downplayed what we were going to be able to do with health because when we started we didn't know how to measure it. So I pushed Joe to go back and look harder at the potential to learn more about health status. And then he linked up with Dr. Bob Brook. At that time, there was very little expertise in the world about how to measure quality of care and health status. If we reduce expenditures with cost sharing, we want to know whether that's at the expense of health or not. And we want to measure that precisely. And we want to measure it throughout the range. Measure this in a way that uh, when the results came out a decade later, uh, people would believe them. So we basically assembled 
the first comprehensive health profile. I was just overwhelmed by the thoughtfulness that went into the design. We were ready to go. At that point, almost exactly at that point, Dick Nixon decided that he was going to abolish the Office of Economic Opportunity. There was an enormous battle that erupted within the Nixon administration. I ended up at HEW with the experiment. HEW. Today, Casper Weinberger, Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, went before the... Sat down with the Secretary of HEW, Casper Weinberger. We called him Cap the Knife for his budgeting proclivities. I promised that if he would give me $4 million more, within three or four years, the whole thing would be wrapped up. Now, I knew that wasn't going to happen in three or four <laughs> years. But I also knew that Cap Weinberger wasn't going to be sitting in that seat three or four years from then. So it was a pretty safe gamble. Anyway, he fell for it. Fortunately, he decided that the experiment could go ahead in Dayton, which was our first site. Once they got the funding for the project, it was really easy to recruit because it was a very desirable uh, gig. This was not only going to be a great opportunity, it was, it was a big one, and it was one that was going to last a long time. They had me at hello, you might say. It's, it was an amazing opportunity. I recruited Chuck Phelps relatively early on. Joe had collected a handful of, of health economists, Jen Acton, Frank Sloan, Susan Marquis, and her husband Kent, who was the big survey design guy on the experiment. Tom Rockwell, who was the first head of the RAND health program, approached me. He came to RAND in June of 1974, having been recruited by Bob Brook. Bob Brook was one of my mentors, and another one was John Ware. My single closest collaborator was Will Manning, who was the lead mental health economist, and Naiwa Duan was the statistician. For me as a statistician, it was like a gold mine. It was the most fantastic thing I've ever worked on. Terrifically exciting in an intellectual sense. I mean, we knew we were at the very forefront of everything that was going on. RAND was kind of like the Disneyland of, of health policy research. It was absolutely spectacular. The HIE team was running an insurance company with all the complexity that that involves. One of the big uncertainties at the start of the experiment, would people actually enroll? We had to, to hire people to go out and convince you to join the study. Then we had to con convince all of the medical societies in the sites that we had that they should be treating our patients. We started collecting data uh, late in 1974. People were signed up for three or five years, but there were different sites that came online at different times. Six sites around the United States, 2,750 families encompassing nearly 8,000 individuals. We did a very bold move to use a um, self-administered survey methodology. This wasn't a thing where you could get on a machine and just type something to Central. You had to fill out a form put what time you're doing and how you're feeling with pen and pencil. There was a never-ending set of data processing issues, all night computing, on big machines. It's a whole different world. It was very painful because you would put in this thing overnight, and if there was a mistake in it, you'd go there the next morning and it would just say, you know, your job failed or something like that. Very depressing. Health spending data are very skewed. A large outlier can blow up a simple mean. Naiwa Duan developed uh, a method of analyzing the data that took account of the weird distributions that existed. So instead of a one-part model, which was what a simple average would be, you'd have a two-part model or a four-part model. Things that are just standard now that came from the RAND experiment. The SF36 is ubiquitous in healthcare analysis. Used in more than 20,000 articles and about 2,000 randomized controlled trials. We developed this episode of illness analysis. You could put any kind of insurance in it and then figure out what people would spend. You could even figure out what kind of insurance plans people would choose. I have to give credit to a lot of people for the methodological advances they made. There were over 400 academic papers that were published. Many of them were very important. We published the first paper in 1981. 
the biggest paper on the project was the economic results that came out in the New England Journal. And that has uh, 2,100 uh, scholarly citations. If you ask people, uh, you know, kind of what, did, what does the HIE tell us? It says cost sharing works um, to reduce utilization. It's a blunt instrument and the poor at particular risk. The economists were happy. Uh, everybody likes to have their beliefs confirmed. The people that had generous insurance uh, went to the doctor more than the people who had stingy insurance. The health outcomes data were the, the ones that were uh, the most surprising to people. I was very surprised. The people on the health side were not happy. People really didn't want to believe it. It's what economists call diminishing returns. With rare exceptions, when you go to full coverage, you're not, you're not gaining much health care and you're getting a lot more money spent. I'm a physician. Uh, if you had told me that putting a financial uh, disincentive in front of me, in front of a person, that would result in less use of care, would not impact their health status or quality of care, I would have said after having just graduated from an esteemed medical school that you gotta be kidding. So we should have seen an effect uh, one would have thought, but I concluded that the only reason we didn't see it is that there were some negative value services. I had thought that when you went to a doctor and you really didn't need a medication or a pill, uh, you wouldn't get it. Um, but that wasn't the case. If you were a healthy person, basically, and you were because care was free, you went in to be seen, uh, there was a possibility that you could be worse off. The number of drugs went up enormously. The number of antibiotics went up enormously. Whereas with the poor and sick, if you went in, the odds were better that medical care would help you. Cost sharing reduced unnecessary medical care, but it also reduced necessary medical care. And I remember the study of pediatric emergency room use. And cost sharing reduced that, particularly for poor, sick children. I thought that deserved uh, a more, and more attention. We are capable in the United States of figuring out how to put a person in space. Uh, why can't we figure out how to have a healthcare system that produces value? to make the interaction of people and the healthcare professionals more productive, to produce more health um, and uh, do it in a way that uh, uh, doesn't bankrupt the country. A problem with healthcare is you need somebody to care about costs. Everybody cares about patients getting better, but it's a trade-off, just like everything. It's hard to imagine uh, any other activity generating so much knowledge that has been so useful over a long period of time. The results of the experiment are very enduring. These results uh, are the only results out there today, 40 years later, that speak to that question. And so they're still used. We're actually completing right now a number of RAND studies evaluating you know, single-payer proposals, for example, that rely on the demand data that was produced during the experiment. I spent several years uh, at the Congressional Budget Office. The results of the Rand Health Insurance Experiment were baked into the foundation of CBO's modeling of the Affordable Care Act. That's what we use because it's the only randomized trial of this magnitude that ever was done in the world. It was fundamental to what the Nixon administration was trying to do. It was fundamental to what the Clinton administration was trying to do, and it was fundamental to the Affordable Care Act under Obama. There was a Supreme Court decision that upheld Obamacare. In his opinion, Roberts cited a lot of his results from the health insurance experiment. And so, in some sense, it really did have something to do with national health insurance. The health insurance experiment put us on the map as a first-rate health policy research institution. I can't tell you how often it is that I interview people who are interested in coming to RAND and say to me, the reason I want to come here is because of the health insurance experiment. That was uh, the reason I came to RAND as a student uh, in 1985. There was definitely a culture of mutual respect 
between the medical people and the social scientists, you had the sense of a common goal. And this extended to uh, people in different disciplines, which was really unique. Interdisciplinary research. Academics can't do this kind of work because you need a team, an interdisciplinary team. That was the great legacy of the health insurance experiment. From multiple disciplines, it produced a whole series of people that went on to run organizations and structures in the country that fundamentally changed the way we think about health services research.